Yes. 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 All right. What happened? Why must resemblance of Jesus be practical instead of essential or ontological? In other words, are you not confusing descriptive texts with prescriptive texts? Mm, okay. Is that your question? Thank you for your question. Very good question. I, I don't see any uh, uh, contradiction there. Okay, uh, Descriptive can be prescri pre prescriptive. Do you agree? Right? Right. Especially when you have been commanded to follow. Right? When something is described and then you are given commandments or when you are given instructions to follow the, that description, then it's pres uh, prescriptive. Right? This is how we reconcile between descriptive instructions and pres prescriptive instructions. Or when instructions, uh, when des descriptive statements do become instructions. So this is how I see it. So when it comes to resembling Jesus, right, um, there are two ways to do so. Uh, following his description or his appearance, right, outwardly, and following his prescriptions, which is his teachings, right? Uh, so we follow both. We resemble Jesus in both. This is how I view Jesus Christ. Uh, we look at him, how he worshipped, how he walked, how he talked, how he gave charity, how he abstained from uh, swine, eating swine meat, because he was a strict observer of the, the Jewish law, the Mosaic law, not Jewish law, the Mosaic law. And uh, when he taught how to, uh, for example, prescriptively, he taught how to worship God, and we do the same thing. We worship one God who is unipersonal. That's it. What's going to happen is if you do that, then um, an avalanche to of to yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So I think we should stick to the plan, if you don't mind. Yeah. So. I, I think, I think it would be okay if he went ahead and asked me a question. That's right. I quoted from what? You quoted from Abraham Gedishtag Eber Eli in John 8:58. Yes. Uh, also, you quoted John 20, 28 in Greek, or Korean's book, I don't also. Very impressive. I, 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 I wanted to ask you, and the question, since Christianity is a product of Judaism, why is it that uh, in terms of what, what I call the Hebrew scriptures, the Septuagint has no indication whatsoever as a distinct being or person called, called God the Son? Well, actually, uh, that would be part of the... See, I believe that the Trinity is revealed between the Old and the New Testament. So the fundamental revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity is in the incarnation of the Son and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That does not mean that there are not images or almost a prophetic type of uh, shadowy uh, statement because there are, kiss the Son lest he be angry with you. There are these references... But, uh, for example, even in the Messianic reference in Isaiah 9-6, where Jesus, I believe Jesus is very clearly in view, where he's called Avi Ad, the Father of Eternity. You're not using Trinitarian terminology there. You're referring to him as, 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 as the Creator. So I think it is due to the reality of the, the fullness of that revelation requiring the actual incarnation and then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to be understood. But to me, the overwhelming argument is the name Yahweh being used of Father, Son, and Spirit. When Jesus' followers use that of, of him, that to me closes, closes the deal, shall we say. 30 seconds for me. Um, James said that um, Trinity was revealed between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Then why did it take Christians almost 400 years to clearly define it? Why were the Christians for the first three centuries struggling with the notion of uh, the divine nature of Jesus Christ. Um, why were the Christian church, church fathers not able to read all that into the scripture? It took Christians 400 years to clearly define the doctrine of the Trinity. This in itself is a huge problem, which is still pending, pending uh, an answer. Right, next. Sorry, can we do it like this, that one question for me, one question for Dr. White, and, you know, in order. So this question should be for me. Because, uh, yeah, yeah.
says about there are other unclean animals that uh, we are not supposed to eat, and, and in some surahs and uh, hadith it says Muhammad was eating some unclean animals like camel and rabbit. So how do you respond to that? Firstly, Muhammad was a messenger of God in that line of messengers. We believe he was a prophet foretold in the Old Testament clearly. To me, it's very, very clear, like the, like the sun. Isaiah 42, I believe, is a direct reference to an Arabian prophet because of the verse 11 of chapter 42, where it's, it actually geographically mentions the location of the person or the people who need to rejoice. Why do the Arabs need to rejoice? Let the villages of Kedar uh, rejoice. Let them shout from the top of mountains, Mount Sela, which is in Medina, right? So in that very chapter, we are told that he will bring a law. After the Mosaic law, the word for law in verse 4 is Torah, a new law, a new way of life. We believe that is definitely Prophet Muhammad. And if you read the rest of the chapter, you will see why we believe that's Muhammad, peace be upon him. So if he brought a new law, he is perfectly in his right to uh, tell us, what he allows and what he does not allow, like previous prophets did. They, they changed rules and laws uh, accordingly, according to their situations and their circumstances. Thank you. If you um, I'll, I'll go ahead and take no, I think it. the mic because just, of... Yeah. Just, uh, I won't take up 30 seconds. I'll just simply say that uh, right now we are intending uh, and planning in uh, no, early November here in London, major debate on whether Muhammad is prophesied in the Old Testament. So uh, keep an eye out for that. We will go in depth on, uh, on those things and I will be joined by a eminent Old Testament scholar on that very issue. So it'll be fun. Yes, um, you made a statement that um, the, um, the... Did you know you look like Shabir Ali? <laughs> <laughs> taller, taller, no, 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 but no, you, you no, do look, look a little bit like Shabir Ali. Um, no, but I'm not. <laughs> Not this time. <laughs> yeah. um, you made a statement that um, the, the revelation of Islam came about uh, 600, 600 years later. Hmm. Historically. So, historically, so why should you know, that be followed because it came so you know, late after the revelation of the gospel, so to speak? I think that's your statement, you, uh, you may have misunderstood what I was trying to say, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, I'll clarify if I can. If that's the case, because you know, would that mean then that the, the Jews, the follower of the Torah, have an argument against the, um, the gospel to say this came so, you know, two, two or 3,000 years mm. later? Mm. And in um, Deuteronomy 17.3, it says that um, the Jews knew who their God was. And if they found anybody worshipping gods that their forefathers are not worship or any new gods, Right, they should put them to death. So, don't they have the right, basically, to, um, if this is what Jesus was saying, to try and stone him because he was a god that they did not know about the forefathers, in that Deuteronomy stated clearly that they didn't know who God was and who he wasn't. Okay. okay, in answer to the second part, uh, no, because Jesus is Yahweh. He is their God. He is the one who made them. And that was the whole point of John 8, 58. Uh, before Abraham was, I am. He uses the very same terminology that Allah used in responding to Moses. But you misunderstood my point in regards to the other issue. What I was saying was that there's a 600-year gap between the time of Jesus and the Quran. And there is no historical evidence for any of the statements of Jesus that are in the Quran during that 600 years. There's only... there's. Everything in the New Testament is first century. Now you've gone 600 years later. If you're going to question the accuracy of what's in the New Testament, then you better six times question the accuracy of what's in the Quran. And, and Muslims don't do that. I find that to be inconsistent. It's not the time gap that's the issue. Uh, it's the lack of historical material in those time, that time period. OK, very quickly, uh, that was a very good question. Uh, rejected uh, Jesus for uh, that very reason. They use the same logic, and uh, we don't accept that rejection. Jesus was indeed a uh, foretold prophet uh, to the Jewish people and the Messiah. Uh, also, the last point you mentioned was uh, the, the New Testament and the Quran. If Quran is truly a revelation from 
God. Then what's the problem of Quran correcting errors in the New Testament? There are clearly, clearly errors in the New Testament. There are mistakes here. The New Testament actually beep, 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 exposed the Old beep, Testament. Beep, beep, beep. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> I have it set for a minute, so at 30 seconds, I've got to come up with a different sound. <clears throat> Adnan, 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 Adnan would never make it as a radio announcer. I'm sorry. It would just, uh, he'd be going into the news all the time. Uh, just, uh, so, Adnan, you've been, uh, it's such an open statement. Uh, frustration has been quite a significant part of your argument. Yes. Um, I would like to go through and, uh, you know, by example, had one uh, in John chapter 11 where Jesus is at the tomb of Lazarus, and it says there in verse 41, so they took the stone away, then Jesus looked up and said, uh, Father, I thank you, you heard me, uh, then uh, he calls out Lazarus. The question I suppose is, does prostration uh, make the, eff the, eff the efficiency of prayer or the efficacy of the prayer more likely, or what's the importance of it if here the prayer worked, that Lazarus came out of the tomb, even though Jesus looked up because he wasn't prostrate, so why, why the importance of the position? Very good question. Thank you for that question. You see, uh, there are two ways to look at uh, how we worship God according to the Old and the New Testament. Okay? One is the general way, and one is a specific way. Okay? How do we know general ways of worshiping God? Right? Looking up, raising your hand, sitting down, okay, bowing, all these things. But there is something very, very consistent about prostration. Every single major prophet of the Old Testament prayed by prostrating. Joshua did it according to 5.14, Joshua 5.14. Right? Numbers, we are told Moses and Aaron, both of them did it. Numbers 26. Genesis 17.3, we are told Abraham did it. Then we are told in Nehemiah that then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. It's very specific, faces to the ground. Okay, it's not only bowing, it is face to the ground, which is the most important aspect of prostration, right? David does it. David, then David and the elders of Israel who were clothed in shackcloth fell upon their faces. This is very, very consistent with what Jesus did. Sorry, James, again. You can take it, ladies <laughs> uh, Just very briefly, uh, the, the mere fact that prostration took place, like I said, does not mean that that was the normative uh, means of prayer. That was not how the, the uh, priest did that during the worship in the temple. Uh, Jesus did not do that every time he prayed, and the Father heard him. Uh, I just think it needs to be recognized that the, the singular act in certain situations does not make it normative for all people at all times. <coughs> no, for me. It's for James. It's for James. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the debate. I just wanted to ask, because um, I've had the pleasure of watching a number of your debates. With, um, you look familiar to me. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I watched a number of debates with yourself and um, 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 Muslim scholars, such as Abdullah Khanda and Anna Rashid. I watched all of your. We're going to be doing another debate this year, me and Abdullah. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the, the first one you had. Yeah, that was um, really good. Yeah, and um, with Shabir Ali, obviously. Um, We're debating again this year, too. <laughs> it's going to be a long year. <laughs> question. Sorry. And so, that's the question. I'm just, just talking. Talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I watch the base, I mean, for me, the, the, the main kind of um, contention she seems to be around the Trinity mm -hmm. with, uh, with, I think, with all three of them, um, with all those the scholars that I mentioned. And so, the um, Bible speaks about, you know, the, the gospel being uh, foolish to the Jews and uh, starting to the Greeks. And like, from your kind of perspective, when you are debating with the Muslim scholars, um, what is the main kind of stumbling block like, that it, it kind of seems to be? Most of the times, what seems to be the kind of the gap that? Okay. Okay. Um, I would answer that by saying that for me, the big frustration is that I believe that Adnan has done this. I believe every Muslim does this. Historically, the Quran comes after both the Torah and the Egypt. But when you turn it around and make the lens through which you look at what came before it, you end up changing the fundamental message of what came before it. Um, I would invite anybody who's interested. Uh, a number of years ago, I preached 85 sermons out of the book of Hebrews. 
Hebrews is one of the greatest examples of the deep, intimate connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The New Testament writers knew what the Old Testament was, and they they accurately represented it and brought it into the very fabric. The Quran never does that with either the Old or the New Testament. That, to me, is the biggest stumble in love, is it's very difficult to get past that so that the other side can really hear what it is you're saying. I'm not sure that you're going to have an answer to it. What I find is someone talking about it. He's live on Facebook right now, just so you know. Um, okay, I'll take a question. Yes. Who, uh, who can understand is being spoken about in Isaiah 53? Very good question. Who is being spoken about in Isaiah 53? I believe according to the Jewish commentaries and Jewish rabbis and looking at uh, the views of uh, many Jewish scholars, uh, it is the state of, sorry, not state, uh, the tribe of Israel. Okay, The tribe of Israel is being uh, addressed there. Some people even say it's Jeremiah, Prophet Jeremiah is being addressed there. Why can it not be Jesus? For a very strong reason. Psalm 91 is also very important which Christians very often ignore. If Isaiah 53 is about Jesus, then who is Psalm 91 talking about? In Matthew chapter 4, we are told that Psalm 91 is actually a reference to Jesus. If it's a reference to Jesus, then Jesus cannot die on the cross. He has to be rescued because when you read Psalm 91, you'll know, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I leave that to you to reconcile Psalm 91 and Isaiah 53. If you can reconcile it, please do come to me and I'll be happy to, more than happy to listen to you. James, your turn. Exactly one minute. I think that's the first time you ever did that. Congratulations. <laughs> Very well done. <laughs> Very well done. Uh, I will answer your question right now. Jesus was rescued. He rose from the dead. Okay. That's the rescue of the Messiah. Just that simple. Just that simple. Question for me. So this is with regards to the story that you spoke about in uh, John 17. 17 5. 17 5, yes. yes. Um, so with regards to the right meaning of the passage where Jesus. The camera's right in the face. Is that, is that high up? Uh, <laughs> 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 clean your pores, <laughs> Jesus? <laughs> So yeah, just reading the passage quickly, it says, uh, now this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ of your sins. Right. Um, I don't know why we kept uh, skipping verse 4. It says here, I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then it goes on to say, and now Father glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Uh, so what it says over here that uh, Jesus explicitly says that the only true God, because I know you mentioned about uh, God in different sense, and we have now also mentioned about the Jews, uh, Elvis being called God, and uh, Elohim is used for um, Moses, I believe, in mm -hmm. Hebrews 7 1. Uh, when he actually says the only true God, now true God can only be one. And according to Jesus, that true God is the Father. True God can only be one what? Well, one, how many words are there? Yeah, the, the, and okay, here's, here, here's, here's the answer. Over and over and over again, when we... My main question was regards to the glory, actually. Uh, so, you know, the that he shared, because I think that was your main contention uh, with regards to that statement. Mm -hmm. And how is it possible for Jesus to have glory with the Father from the beginning? And I think you used the word co-glorious. Yes. Now... Just like James did. Yeah. In Isaiah 42, 8, it says the Father... My glory I will not give to another. Mm -hmm. Yes, he says, I'm the Lord, that is my name, and my glory. And what is that word, give. Lord? What is that, what is that word, Lord? Do you see in your translation there? Is uh, it all, in all uh, caps? I read the English translation. But is it in all capital form? Well, they didn't have capitals in Hebrew, did they? No, but in English. Well, that's, that's the interpreters. Okay, let me, let, me answer, let me answer the question. The reason I was asking you the question that you didn't want to answer answer for some reason is, if it's in all capitals, that's the English Bible translator's way of letting you know that the underlying Hebrew is Yahweh. That's Yahweh speaking. Yahweh says, I will not give my glory to another. The Lord is in capitals. If yes. Yes, and that's, is in capitals. that's the point. Yes. That's Yahweh speaking. And why do New Testament writers consistently take those passages and apply them to Jesus? 
just as Paul does in, in the Carmen Christi, as John does in John 12, 41, in regards to Jesus. See, that's the point. When you talk about the one true God, there is one true God, Yahweh. But the New Testament taken as a whole, both in the Gospels, Paul, everybody else, identifies the Father as Yahweh. It's the Father who in Isaiah 53 lays our, son, our sins upon the Messiah. Identifies the Son as Yahweh, Psalm 102, 25, 27, applied to him. And the Spirit is the Spirit of the Lord, L-O-R-D, in caps, Spirit of Yahweh. One name, three different persons. One being of God, three persons. That's called the doctrine of the Trinity. That was my question, actually. He doesn't share the glory. Yahweh in the Old Testament. You're, you're assuming Unitarianism. That's what I was just responding. My response to that, yes, she did not answer the question because glory, um, when what we believe is the Father speaking in the Old Testament, and this is how the Jews understood it. According to the book of Isaiah, chapter 63, verse uh, 16, Father is speaking to the Israelites. It is the Father. And how do we know this? In the Gospel of John, again, chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus confirms that, that you, the Jews, it is the Father who glorifies me, uh, uh, who, who you, the Jews, actually worship as God. So the Jews only knew the Father. And the Father is telling them, I will not share my glory with anyone. Why do the Jews have to believe that now? If the New Testament authors are claiming that there is now glory for Jesus Christ also, why do they have to believe uh, that new version? That's my 30 seconds gone. Uh, next question for me, yes. I forgot to start. Sorry, sorry about that. Partly, yes. Yeah, partly correct. Mm. Now, considering Surah 5, 47, mm -hmm. and Surah 5, 68, mm. which would both uh, indicate to Christians to judge by the, the Gospel and to Jews to judge by the Torah, as well as to uphold it, and also considering... No, it says judge by what God has revealed therein. In the Gospel. In the Gospel. And it's one Gospel, by the way, because yeah. the Quran does not acknowledge the plurality of Gospels. So well, the, well the, the four Gospels are the Gospel according to Matthew, the Gospel according to Mark. So it's yeah, the Quran is saying Gospel according to Jesus. Yeah, it's a Gospel. Do you, do you have that? We have the Gospel according to Mark, the Gospel according to Matthew. Luke. Do you have the Gospel according to Jesus? So, yes. Yeah, okay. So okay. Let's go. Yeah, the Will gospel you? is the good news. Okay. So those are the accounts. Right. Anyway, considering that, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Considering that um, the Quran affirms clearly that those are reliable scriptures, um, and it also affirms that. Um, so I'm just let me just get it here. The Quran actually doesn't affirm that. In Surah three fifty five, mm -hmm. it says that Allah promises to make the true believers of Jesus superior to those who disbelieve yes. until the day of resurrection. Yes. So wouldn't it logically follow that since we are the ones that are here and we know basically historically all the um, the documents that, that were from the time of Muhammad as well as previously. Um, basically what do you make of this? When, when was this corruption done? Was it before Muhammad and then afterwards Muhammad? Very, very good question. Thank you. Firstly, very quickly, let me comment on Psalm 91. If you read Psalm 91 clearly, James said he was resurrected and that's how he was saved. Psalm 91 clearly says, you will only observe. Cheating. <laughs> You're cheating, no. God. <laughs> you know you are. No, you, you're killing my time. No harm, no harm will come, no harm will befall you. You will not be harmed. Isaiah 53 says he will be pierced, he will be damaged, he will be all those things. So that's, that's where I was talking about reconciliation. Coming back to your point very quickly. Uh, Quran is talking about those followers of Jesus who actually followed his true teachings and they were superior for four centuries. And after that the Muslims became the true followers of Jesus. This is how the debate 
uh, uh, went that way. I showed uh, uh, conclusively that Muslims are actually true followers of Jesus Christ, that they resemble Jesus in not uh, outward practice only, but in uh, inward practice only, uh, also. Sorry? My time is up. <laughs> But I can answer if you want. If, 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 right. When is the day of resurrection? No. And, and we, the Muslims, we believe the Muslims are the true followers of Jesus Christ. Firstly, for the first, for first four centuries, uh, Christians were majority, the majority of Christians, they were Unitarians. They were not Trinitarians, by the way. And if you want to talk about that, we can talk about that. Okay? He can't yeah. stop. <laughs> I took your permission. <laughs> uh. 30 seconds. Um, that is uh, a subject that I have uh, debated before and there needs to be a much fuller debate because I think Surah 547 is one of the, from my perspective, is one of the clearest historical and logical problems for believing that the Quran is actually from God. I really do believe that and I would love to have the opportunity of doing that in a much fuller discussion. We can't do it in 30 seconds. So. Right, so my question is actually regarding um, what has Jesus ever said that he was uh, divine or God in that nature. And uh, from my reading, I've seen uh, Revelation 22.30, where he says, I am the Alpha and Omega. So what's your understanding of what Jesus says there? Oh, there are a number of texts in the book of Revelation. I just would assume uh, most of the time, I'm sorry, whoops. Hey, you took a bunch of extra time. Um, uh, I'll just borrow some of it back. Most of the time when that argument is made, uh, the Muslim is uh, limiting the statements to only the Gospels and not anything outside of that. And normally the book of Revelation isn't included. But yes, Jesus identifies himself as the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He identifies as Lord God Almighty in the book of Revelation. He's called our great God and Savior in Titus 2.13, our God and Savior in 2 Peter 1.1. Um, uh, it, it's, it's all through uh, the, the text of, of the New Testament, but that's in perfect harmony and consistency with Jesus' own statements where he says before Abraham was, I am, not my memory, not my knowledge of, in God's foreknowledge, I am, I was in the presence of the Father glorious, and that's why he accepts Thomas' uh, worship as well. So uh, there is a wonderful, beautiful consistency all across the New Testament on that subject. My 30 seconds. 30 seconds. You see, see this little hand right there on the thing there? See how that goes around? Okay, I'll look at it now. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to us again today. I would like to thank you all for being uh, an amazing audience. I would like to thank James again for being an amazing interlocutor. And um, God bless you all. We love you all. I hope to continue in this spirit for the coming years. And hopefully... We will find out, if not in this world, on the Day of Judgment, whether Jesus actually was a Muslim or resembled Muslims more or not. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.